All right, today we're gonna talk about my top 10 completed series. So completed, I finished reading them and they're finished out. That means Stormlight's not on here. Malazan's not on here. Of course, Wheel of Time, not on here. <laughs> Rook and the Rose is not on here. So things that you might expect are not gonna be on this list, but I did it. I took 10 series that I love more than all other series and I made a list and I ranked them. To be a favorite series means I want to reconsume you. It means I am tempted to purchase all special editions of you. It is, you know, you brought me so much joy in a moment and I want to revisit that joy. That's what makes a favorite for me. I know not everyone's a rereader or reconsumer of media. If you make me want to reread you and you left an impact, you're a favorite. So these are my 10 as of right now in August of 2022. And we're going to get into it starting with number 10. That is the Winter Night Trilogy by Catherine Arden. I actually did reread this last December into earlier this winter, and it's lovely. So this is a story about Vasya. She's this girl growing up in essentially a 14th century Rus. This is a historical fantasy, so it's inspired by that time. And it's also this point in history where paganism and Christian orthodoxy are kind of coming to a head. And she has a relationship with the spiritual side of her village, and normally that's fine, but a force comes in and kind of messes with that status quo. And she's trying to save everyone, because there's this kind of horrific element that creeps in when you have this clash of religious forces. And also, she's just trying to live her best life, and she's supposed to go to a nunnery or be a wife, and neither of those are the right options for her. And this trilogy, you just get to explore herself, you know, how she deals with that. There are animal companions, there is a death god. It's fantastic. You get to explore grief in the third book in a way that I truly resonate with. And the first book just keeps giving on reread. Like, oh my goodness, I only liked the first book on my first read through this trilogy. And maybe the first book's my favorite now. Like, it was so rewarding to reread the first book, especially knowing where everything's going. So I highly recommend this. As everyone says in every winter release recommendation video, perfect for the winter. I never feel so cold as when I read this. And kind of on the opposite side, I never feel so warm as when the third book takes place kind of near summer. Like, your relationship to the environment is going to be very strong as you read this series. And I just love it. I own the hardbacks. It's a great time. Number nine, and like this bottom half of the list, I just truly want you to know, it could go either way on any given day. But I think right now I want to reread this the least of the other ones in the bottom half of this list. And that's the Tex Kalan duology, which I still love. Um, all of these, I think almost all of them I have reviews for. So those will be down in the description if you want more thoughts. But the Tex Kalan duology is so interesting for me personally as a reader, because I love both books in this series for such different reasons. So the first one is like, my definition of like a perfect introspective thematic slow burn sci-fi story like you have this political intrigue you're exploring imperialism what does it mean to belong language memory i have a 22 minute spoiler free review on that book because there's so much to discuss in terms of ideas and i love it i truly just like i always want to reconsume it even though in theory it's only a four four and a half star read in terms of pacing in terms of actual entertainment so it's kind of one of those books that became a favorite, even though like, I don't think I've ever rated it five stars. It's one of those nebulous things. Whereas A Desolation Called Peace has all of my sci-fi tropes in terms of plotting, pacing, character interactions. We have more point of views. I have a blast reading it, but it doesn't stick with me as much as the first book. Granted, I've read the first book twice and only the second book once, but I do want to reconsume them. They're actually right behind me. Um, like you really can't see them, but they're behind my shoulder right here. And I, I love them. I will read anything Arcady Martin writes after this stunning like debut of a duology. Like I, they might've written another short stories or something, but in terms of novels, knocked them out of the park. Cannot wait to see what they come out with next. Now, number eight, we are at the Greenbone Saga by Fonda Lee. I, I struggled on where to put this. Like I said, the bottom half of this list is just so difficult. And I think part of this is that when I think of the entire trilogy, for me, Jade War is still just weak for me. I like it way more now that I've completed the trilogy and I see how it fits in and why we spent time doing XYZ. But I think just because it has a weak spot, I put it lower on the list. That said, I freaking love this trilogy. It is so good. Um, 
It's an urban fantasy set in sort of kind of like 1980s technology time in a secondary world. And you have this family and this family is kind of gangsters. And you are watching this family over the course of what, 25 or 30 years in this trilogy, the highs and the lows as they are kind of combating changes in the global atmosphere, but also with this other clan, the mountain clan. So you, you see how they pivot and adjust to new global situations, but also to their clan war. And then the interpersonal family stuff. There's just so much. If you like family dramas, if you like Game of Thrones, if you like that show called Succession, gotta try it out. I really enjoyed it. Jade Legacy is one of the best series enders I've ever read. And I mean, and I'm an endings person. Like, that's the thing is like, if, if it doesn't stick the landing, it's probably not going to be on this list, at least for me and by my tastes. And yeah, I only kind of regret that I didn't purchase the Illuminate Special Editions a little bit. I don't actually mind having just the hardbacks. They are very stunning on my shelves. But that is number eight. So number seven is the Lady Trent series. The Lady Trent series stole my heart last year, and I want to reconsume them almost every day. I consume these primarily on audiobook, except for the sixth companion novel. I read that because it was kind of mixed media and like very different because it doesn't follow Isabella Trent. It follows her granddaughter. And I love this series. It's not that deep. It's very like watching a television show for me. Like it was such comfort food, but that it was, I read the second book in a day. Like I don't read books in a day. That's not the type of reader I am. And all I want to do is hang out with Isabella. That's all I ever want to do. <laughs> she is one of my favorite characters. And I can recognize when people talk about it and some of the flaws, especially if they don't like Isabella, because it's not perfect, and I don't think it was meant to be. I think when, when Marie ben Brennan put this together and kind of do a secondary world that's inspired by our Victorian era, there are some things where, like, we're fighting the patriarchy because it has the patriarchy, and there's also some kind of sort of clumsy attempts at white saviorism that Isabella does. But I don't think it's meant to be romanticized, and I think that's why it works for me, is, like, Isabella fully knows, as an old lady, that she was in the wrong when she did X, Y, and Z, and she was kind of an idiot. And so I kind of like that type of like very aggressive, stark reflection. And I just found her funny and lovable and the dragon stuff was just fun. There is a romance in here that I love with all of my heart. This series is just so cozy for me. And I read it because Marie Brennan wrote Rook and the Rose, which if I was making it an incomplete series list would definitely be near the top. Now coming into the next one, shouldn't be no surprise. Maybe you're surprised it's not higher on the list. I don't know, this is just this is just where it fell, and that's Machineries of Empire by Yoon Ha Lee. I get so happy every time someone on someone else's channel goes, Nine Fox Gambit, which Literature Science Alliance talks about, like, yes, I am the Nine Fox Gambit channel. That's what I want to be known for. I'm cool with that. I'm totally cool with that. If people talk about Mask of Mirrors because of me, Nine Fox Gambit because of me, that's fine. I'm totally good with that being my vibe. Um, I love this trilogy. This is another one where, like, the first book I gave four stars... But maybe it's a five star read, even though I recognize it is not a perfect book. And the last book really stuck the landing. This is a weird series. I have a lot of content for this series on my channel that you can check out. But it's basically military space opera sci-fi in one of the most aggressive world building situations you'll ever encounter in the first book, where you have Cheris, who is just too dosh darn good at her job. And so she gets saddled with an impossible task and she has to use resources that are unconventional. And even if she accomplishes the goal of this empire, which we don't even know if we're on board with the goal, right? Like we don't even know. We're just like following Cheris. We're on her team. So she has to form a team with this person who's like potentially not that sane in mind. And probably when this is all over, they're going to expose her because she's expendable and they just needed to get a job done. Like, that's the situation our main character's in. And the, the sci-fi elements are so magical and vibrant and amazing. And this society, and the more you learn about it and you learn the goals and trajectories, I just cannot wait to reread this. I cannot wait. It is so good. I love it so much. <laughs> so... I think this could potentially go way further up the list on reread. It's just I've only gotten to read it once so far. But I love them, and I love the covers, and I will read any adult work that you and Holly puts out because, gosh darn it, they are funny, and they like to get weird in their adult works, and I'm here for it. All right, so now in this top five, I think these I feel more solid on. Once we got near the, like, favorite favorites, I was like, yeah, this is where people sit. And at number five, I put it lower mainly because I haven't read it in, like, the last five five or six years. I think I read it seven years ago, so it needs a new reread to like really affirm, but there's a lot of nostalgia behind it. Like I can't imagine it never being on this top 10. And that is His Dark Materials by Philip Pullman. 
I love this series and it holds up for me as an adult. I have probably read it three, maybe four times. Like I said, the last time I read it was when I moved to Boston seven years ago. And I love it. This is the trilogy that taught me pain. <laughs> like, I don't know, it taught me loss. There, There is a platonic romantic bonds in this story that get tested. And I loved that exploration. I thought it was very important and informative for me as a kid. I actually, it's so silly in hindsight reading this as like a 12 or 13 year old and then I go into physics and it's like, of course I went into physics because this was the type of stuff that was grabbing me. This and Brandon Sanderson, like it was like these hard magic systems, sci-fi based fantasies were what were calling to me. Because there's an argument to be made that His Dark Materials is also just as much of a sci fantasy as say like the Broken Earth trilogy. And I loved it. I loved it so much. Like, I think the first book's my least favorite, but like Will and Lyra are like my definition of like what I search for in a reading experience when I want a duo that are close to each other. I mean, similar with Lyra and Pan, like it's just, I love this trilogy. And I know for some people, they don't like some of the theming that goes on. I think even as a kid, I actually really liked the religious commentary, but I was raised Unitarian Universalist. So like it wasn't a traditional religious upbringing anyways. <laughs> so. It's just great for me. I'm really liking the show. I feel like the show has really gone under the radar for a lot of people. I don't think it's the best adaptation I've ever seen, but it's actually a very solid one. Like I would give it like an eight out of 10 and nobody talks about it online. I think it's because it's not like as controversial as the Wheel of Time adaptation or, you know, the Game of Thrones adaptation and stuff, but it's, it's, it's actually really solid and I actually really like it. I think it's faithful to the material. It's really fun to watch. I'm excited for the third season to see how they wrap it up, especially because like, I think the third book's my favorite, so I don't know. I love his dark materials and I haven't gotten to talk about it a lot on the channel because I haven't read it in so long. So maybe I'm due. I did get the Folio Society books and maybe I'll read from them in the new future when I'm feeling particularly nostalgic, but I've been kind of wanting to wait till the show's done because I don't want to like be comparing the show to the book too closely. It's not my favorite way to do that type of stuff. But number four is the newest addition to make it this high on the list. And you're probably not surprised if you've been here for the past couple of months, but it's a chorus of dragons because it, the chorus of dragons is so freaking good. <laughs> and I want to reread it a lot, like all the time, actually. I'm so mad I didn't pick it up when I saw it at a Barnes and Noble in 2019. I just didn't pick it up because this cover, it's not a great cover. It's not a bad cover. It's just the most generic fantasy cover that could ever exist. I think we can all agree. Throw dragon on cover. That's a fantasy book. But I don't think that tells you anything. I think for me, it screamed sword and sorcery, which is not my subgenre. And it has those elements, but it's just like so much more. It's got sci-fi elements. It's just, I love it. And I have, a, I have a should you read for it and everything and where I go into who I think this is for. But just know this is pretty much the perfect series for me. It was entertaining from beginning to end. I laughed. I had emotions. I was invested. I just, I was so stressed for all of my favorite characters all the time. And I was always intrigued and I always wanted to know why are we here? What are we doing? What's happening next? And now in hindsight, I'm so excited to read it all again. Any book that I can read while I am stressed out of my mind is a winner. And this, this first book I read the week before my defense, I couldn't do anything the week before my defense. And I somehow could read this book. Shocking to me. It, that's how engaging to me it was. That's how much my taste this series is. So it had to make the top five. It just, it just had to. This next one shouldn't be a surprise. This is my Sanderson edition and that's Mistborn. I, I, this is just the first era because the second era is not finished yet. I love Miss Bourne. I actually reread it last year and I have videos on the first two spoiler filled and then I have a spoiler free review. And I just, gosh, I've been reading this series since like 2007. Gosh, it's so comfortable to me. I, I read it all the time. I think I've read it four times. Every time I love it. Every time I do. Um, I think it varies how much I love each book in the series each time. Well of Ascension, still my fave. Still my fave. Hero of Ages, I think, is less impactful each time I read it, although it's still very good. And then Final Empire this time, I really enjoyed the found familyness of it. I just have so much fun. I truly do. And it's just like, I get the critiques that exist in the universe about this series, about how he overly describes the magic system and how many times can he say push and pull. But for me, it doesn't matter. I just don't read those words. And I think that's part of what happens when you're not a descriptive like reader in your head. Like if you don't see things when you read, you kind of self train yourself to pay attention to certain words more than others, which is 
a benefit and not a benefit, but it's a benefit for reading Mistborn because, yeah, I just don't pay attention to those parts of the fight scenes because I don't visualize that. So I don't know. I love it. Vin's journey, amazing. Ellen, I love Ellen. I, I love him. What is interesting, rereading Mistborn after rereading so many other parts of the Cosmere, is you really see Sanderson's type when he does character works and his thematic focus, like what he likes to muse about and things like that. So I really love Mistborn. I mean, I love, I mean, is it not obvious that I love the Cosmere? I guess I could have done like that route. I could have said the Cosmere, but talk about something that is incomplete. So that does not belong on this list. And now number two is also a new edition. And when I was thinking about whether Mistborn should be at number two or this series, I was like, Mistborn, I don't love every book equally. This series, there is no true imperfection except for one tiny thing that I don't even truly mind, and that is the Live Ship Trader series by Robin Hobb. Oh my goodness, even if I never like another thing that she has written more than this, it was worth it to read the Live Ship Trader series. I have spoiler stuff for all of this. I have a spoiler-free review for the first book and for the entire series. I have a Robin Hobb book tab. I love the Live Ship Trader series with all my heart, and every time someone picks it up and loves it, I just... I bask in it. I'm just so excited. I, I love all these books equally. Even though they're 900 page tomes, I can read them in like four or five days. I'm really excited to reread them. I went on eBay to search for the books that are behind me because I wanted to have the original US hardbacks at least until maybe one day we get illustrated editions. The amount I need someone to draw me Bingtown and the live ships. Ugh, I need it so bad. <laughs> I love this series. It stole my heart. I was so shocked because I give Farseer Trilogy as a whole like a four, four and a half star rating. I liked it. It wasn't going to be on this list, but I liked it. Um, Live Ship Traders, though, is like the reason I read fantasy. Like, that's what I want. Like, that's like you, you ask me, why are you a fantasy reader? Because I want to experience what I experienced while I read the Live Ship Traders series. That is why. <laughs> okay. So now getting into number one, this should be not surprising. You're probably at this point, if you know me, being like, Angela, Where's the Jemison representation? Here it is with the Broken Earth trilogy. Of course, the goat, truly, honestly. Nothing else can top this series. <laughs> I don't even know if Jemison can top this series because I've read everything she's written at this point and I love all of it. I don't really think I give much. I think there's one book I give four stars. It's just that like, this is the standout. This is the favorite. This is the thing I've already reread. <sighs> it's fantastic. It's so good <laughs> and like, what, what else is there to say? I feel like everyone who's read this who does like it agrees that this is like the definition of a modern masterpiece. Um, the use of second person, the different point of views, the sci fantasy of it all, the commentary. Like, I feel like now if you read it, you're like, it's a little on the nose. When this was published in 2015, no, no one was talking like this. We weren't having own voices literature yet. Like, this was groundbreaking okay and I know 2015 is not that far ago but like truly there were not that many people of color being purchasable on my shelves at the bookstore and here she was writing an unapologetic piece commentary on these sort of things and also just ignoring the commentary it's so engaging it's so cool it's so gripping it's just like how are these people going to survive what is happening and then cool magic and it's just so gripping. And I get why it doesn't work for some people, but also it's one of the few times where like, I think people are wrong when they don't like it. <laughs> like, I'm kind of kidding, but also it's, it's how much I love it. Like truly it's number one. Like, and I just think she's masterful. I, I truly think that it's one of those rare instances where I was equally entertained and intu intellectually involved. And it's really rare for a book to do both of those. Sometimes it's like the Texcalon duology, where like Memory Called Empire was intellectually stimulating for me, but it wasn't as entertaining, you know, like, but this was both for me. I was intellectually there having fun, like parsing things and like thinking about things. But also I was just like entertained. I was just like, what's happening? Who are these people? What's going on? So yeah, that's my top 10. And I'm sure it'll change. I hope it changes. Gosh, I hope I don't suddenly not have new favorites. And I don't know how often I'll update this. I'll probably every two years. I don't know. These are hard lists to make. I feel like they're easy to watch. I love watching them. But to make one of your own, it's like, have I forgotten anything? 
<laughs> so that's it for this one. If you want to tell me your favorite series, feel free to put that down in the comments down below. If you agree with any of my favorites, let me know. If you don't like any of my favorites, let me know, but be kind because I truly love them <laughs> with all of my heart. Like I love all of these so, so much. If you want to leave an emoji, leave an earth for the Broken Earth Trilogy. And otherwise, like if you liked it, subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye. Thank you.